This is The Politics of Everything, and I'm your host, Amber Danes. Welcome to the podcast where we want to discuss the politics of everything, from money to motherhood, nutrition to narcissism, startups to secularism, the environment to equality, and much more. Our guests are experts in their field or topic of choice, even if you've not yet heard their name. This is a bipartisan podcast, so while we love exploring varied views and get a buzz from a healthy debate, by no means is this a one-sided forum for any one political view. So please listen up and enjoy the politics of everything. A big hello as we dive into the politics of everything, episode nine. Today, I'm going to get my head around the politics of superannuation with the help of wealth management expert, Stephen Huppert who says Australia could be doing a whole lot better when it comes to how we regulate and invest in our super, despite our island nation often being showcased as a beacon of superannuation success globally. Stephen is the head of product innovation at Trustee Partners, which he joined in 2016. He offers offers us 25 years of experience in superannuation, life insurance and funds management. And prior to his latest gig, Stephen spent 16 years in consulting at the likes of Ernst & Young and most recently a partner at Deloitte. He's a fellow of the Institute of Actuaries of Australia and so we are certainly in safe hands when it comes to understanding the way superannuation needs to be managed. Welcome, Stephen. Thanks, Amber. Pleasure to be here. So let's dive right in. So compulsory superannuation has been in Australia for a long time, since the 80s, um, brought in through the hawke Keating government years as a way for everyday earners of wages and salaries to have more independent retirement and not sort of depending on the pension or government in our older years. There are added tax breaks for employees who top up their super too, and that was sort of added a little bit later. So really what has changed about super and its needs in the last 30 years or so? Yeah, look, it's, it's interesting looking at super, superannuation, where it is now and where it's come from. And it must be a timely thing because there's been a couple of recent books published on that very topic, looking at the history of super, right back to the beginnings of, of the compulsory system with the Hawke-Keating government and seeing it as a, as, as a real um, uh, standout uh, policy uh, decisions by, the, by that government at the time. And it wasn't an easy one to get through. Um, with people on both sides of politics. And why was that? Is that because we did expect the government to kind of look after us or that it wasn't something that, you know, I guess culturally we'd, we'd done before? Yeah, so prior to that, there's always been, you know, over 100 years of history of people getting superannuation or pensions in Australia. But that was typically if you work for a big bank or a big mining company, there was the corporate scheme. But the bulk of Australians didn't get access to that, but tended to always see the age pension as something that would be there when they retire. And part of the reason it was a difficult transition through the compulsory was on both sides. The uh, employers didn't want to pay the additional 3% as what it was at the time. But even on the union movement, there were many in the union movement that wanted that additional 3% to go into direct into wage increases rather than uh, deferred wage and not being accessible until retirement. So fast forward now, I mean, we're obviously living longer than ever and a lot of Australians, you know, live to 90, 100 years of age. So where are we at with super? I mean, we talk about increases, you know, by 2025 to say 12% from your nine, nine and a half percent at the moment. Is that going to be enough? I I think on, on its own, no. And we have to look at saving for retirement as more than just superannuation. So I prefer to look back and say, stand back a bit and say, well, how are we going to provide for our life in retirement? And as you correctly pointed out, retirement is getting longer and longer. Um, you know, when superannuation was introduced, life expectancy was quite modest, but you know, we are looking at 90 to 100 as being becoming more and more norm. So, to try and fund for that, superannuation will never be enough. People will have to look at equity in their home. Um, we are seeing people transitioning through to retirement. So retirement is no longer falling off a cliff. People are doing part-time work, um, moving in and out of the workforce. And part of that is because they don't want to be idle. But part of it also is to help fund their lifestyle in, re- in retirement or semi-retirement. So, so superannuation will never be the only source of income in retirement going forward. And I think that's an important aspect. 
Sounds like it's a more holistic approach that we all need to to consider. And you sort of mentioned people who are retiring or semi-retiring. We call it the dial it downers, I think, where you kind of take on less work, but you're still working. I mean, that's all well and good. But of course, a lot of people don't necessarily find jobs in Australia over a certain age, particularly if you have a corporate job or if you have a physical job, you probably can't do it. So what are some of the other strategies you would encourage older Australians to think about? I think that's right. And I think a lot of the debate around superannuation is focused on superannuation and the age pension being the only source of income in retirement. And I think as a society, we need to adapt better to um, living longer. Using equity in the home is one of the things we're going to start seeing more and more products that are called reverse mortgages, for example, because what we're finding is many Australians, when they get to retirement, certainly the current generation, uh, are quite asset rich, but cash flow poor. They have quite substantial equity in their home. And do they want to sell it and downsize or can they somehow access that equity in retirement to help fund their retirement in the sort of short to medium term? Mm, that's very interesting. And I, I suppose that brings me to, to my next round of questions, which is the idea that, you know, I, you know, co-founder of Atlassian, Mike Cannon Brooks, obviously Atlassian is one of the unicorn companies that grew from, you know, little humble beginnings to brand icon status and is, I think, valued around five billion US dollars. He's been quoted as saying, most of Australia's super is invested as if I'm going to retire in five years, but I'm not going to retire in 20 years. It's too conservatively invested and it's overweight on BHP and the big four banks. So this kind of statement, he kind of obviously has his own vested interest because he's encouraging the idea we should be investing in, I guess, tech businesses like his or Uber or Netflix or Facebook or any of those sorts of business models. What do you think that kind of really means? Look, I think there is a broader uh, conversation about where superannuation funds are investing. And whilst many are invested in, in the index or in very close to the index, and in Australia that is dominated by the banks, BHP, et cetera, I mean, that's more of a problem with the Australian economy and the Australian uh, share market. And I think there is a domestic bias that many super funds have got, but we see that everywhere in the world where there is that domestic bias to your own share market. In terms of investing in longer term assets, certainly many funds will have 10, 15% in infrastructure, private equity. We know that superannuation funds own many of the large assets in Australia, such as, um, airports and, 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 and harbours and things like that. So to say that superannuation funds are only investing in for the next five years is a bit disingenuous because superannuation funds do invest longer. But they've also got, even though we're not retiring for 40 years, there's certainly a liquidity challenge because people have choice of fund in Australia and portability of their superannuation account. So if a fund invested in illiquid assets because they want to invest for the long term and they get members wanting to move out of the fund, then that would be challenging. So we have quite a tension within a fund for that longer term time horizon around retirement investing, but needing that short term liquidity because we do have portability of superannuation in Australia. Right. And so overseas, that's not necessarily the case. So if you look at some of the very large pensions funds in the UK or US, for example, or Canada, um, they're largely defined benefit funds which means there's no investment choice. So people can't choose within a fund which option to invest in. And also they're typically locked in to retirement into the one fund. So there's not that portability. Now, globally, we're seeing a move away from defined benefit to a defined contribution as we do in Australia. So that will become more of an issue in other, in other markets. But at the moment, it's, it's certainly given the Australian uh, industry, the Australian superannuation has got that portability of, of capital. It means we're always going to have that tension between long-term retirement time horizons and short-term liquidity needs to allow people to switch either within a fund or between funds. I guess that's where experts like you uh, come into the come into the play as well. That's right, and it's important to you know do the modelling on the fund to understand the the member base and therefore set the um, investment strategy accordingly. So, thinking a little bit about self managed super funds, they were sort of all the rage, if you like, a few years ago. And I remember my own business advisor trying to encourage me to set one up. However, I decided not to. It, it sort of has gone out of favour a little bit. I think the appeal for a lot of people was being able to buy a property, for example, which um, property obviously has had a good run in major capital season in Australia in, in the past three or four years. 
So what is the major drawback for people who perhaps want to go into this area and are they really likely to stay around these funds? I think what what self-managed super funds have been telling us and the rise of self-managed super funds is that people are unhappy with what's being offered by the the existing businesses. And and we're seeing self-managed super funds could be seen as a true disruption to the industry um, in the way we're seeing big disruptions in many industries where consumers want to take more control of their experience. So at the moment in superannuation, you've got two choices really, the big industry funds on one side and the big retail funds, predominantly bank-owned funds on the other side. And part of the rise of self-managed super funds are people saying, actually, we don't like either of those models and we think we can do it better ourselves. And do you need a special skill set to do that? I suppose when I looked into it, it was it was a little bit expensive to set up um, and then I felt like I would still need the guidance of my advisor to really make sure that I was doing the right thing, if that makes sense. Absolutely does. And unfortunately, what we see too often is financial services, we find products being sold rather than needs being met. And so a lot of people have been sold self-managed super funds under the illusion they're going to have more control or they'll get better outcomes, when really it's the advisor that benefits from that sale of a self-managed super fund. And a lot of people in self-managed super funds uh, aren't there for the right reason and probably end up getting worse outcomes rather than better outcomes. And we are starting to see a bit of a movement back um, into established funds. And that's especially at the older age where you might be in your 40s, say, or 50s, quite able to manage your own affairs. But as you become 70, 80, maybe one, one of the partner dies, then having your own fund becomes a burden and something that's hard to manage. So there are some big risks with self-managed super funds. And what we're seeing is people trying to find products that will be similar to a self-managed super fund experience, but not have the risks and the costs associated with it. And they do exist. There is that kind of middle ground, if you like. We are seeing that. So some of the big uh, industry funds have what they call member-directed options, where you can have individual shares and other assets as part of your industry fund experience. We're seeing some of the uh, platforms being developed by the retail banks that allow a bit more flexibility and a bit more control. And we're also starting to see the rise of niche superannuation funds like Spaceship Super that, again, is trying to talk to you in in your language and provide a more personal uh, experience that people don't get in a big mega fund that, that just treats them as one of the average. That's the thing. I guess you always think it's your money and you should have a degree of control over it. That, that's right. That's right. And that's what some of the uh, big funds are starting to recognise that and try to do that. And some of the smaller new startup funds are very much tapping into that sort of uh, uh, emotional connection with, with their members. So in your role now at Trustee Partners, what are you really offering clients? I mean, you describe yourself as a new model for trusteeship in Australia. That's all about proactive risk management, responsiveness, technology and relationships. That sounds amazing, but really what's the end goal? What are you trying to achieve for your clients? Yeah, so we're a business-to-business proposition uh, where our end clients are the people who want to develop innovative financial services products. And one of the things that will never change in financial services is that you'll always need a regulatory regime to operate and you'll always need strong governance, risk and compliance framework around whatever products you offer. So what we're saying to the innovators in the market is you stick to what you're good at, the innovative product design, marketing, angle, whatever the case may be, and trustee partners will be your be be the solid framework behind it to provide the license, the regulatory framework, and deal with those issues so you can be innovative responsiveness and, and provide those true member experiences. So with that, I mean, who would be the sorts of organisations or individuals you'd work with? Are we talking the banks? Who, who, who sort of are you targeting in that? It tends to be more independent providers. Um, we do do some work with some of the banks and some of the more established businesses who are looking at outsourcing their trustee services or some of the startup funds. And I mentioned Spaceship Super previously, and that's an example of one of our clients that is is trying to do it very differently. But uh, unlike other industries like, say, Uber or Airbnb, and they can just say, well, we're going to do it differently and we're going to ignore the, the law, if you like. Um, in financial services, it's harder to do that. So what we're saying to the disruptors is 
You do what you want to do and be disruptive and we'll deal with all the regulatory and legal requirements and and help you uh, do that. So you know, our client base will be a mixture of startup funds, but also some of the more established businesses that are trying to do things differently and trying to move away from a, a product-centric to a client-centric business model. And ultimately, how will that help individuals and, the, and their clients, for example? I mean, what, what are they really – you talk about – we talk about access to, to the funds, we talk about the flexibility. Is it likely to be lower fees and, you know, a better profit margin? I mean, what, what would people really, really get out of this if this is the model moving forward for superannuation? I think certainly fees and returns are part of it, but I think what we've seen over the last few years that fees and returns is only part of what's needed to help people get a better outcome in retirement. And we see that the better outcomes in retirement typically come with a more engaged member who understands where their superannuation is, understands how it's being invested, understands that actually they do need to manage it more more closely in terms of what sort of outcomes they need in retirement. And what we're saying to our clients is you focus on that. You you put your money and your effort into developing better member propositions and then we deal with all the uh, compliance stuff that you don't yeah, that doesn't give value. Stuff you don't want to do, I guess. And <laughs> doesn't give that value to well, the end consumer. Well, that's what you do. Absolutely. You know, that's, and that's and by doing that. it at scale, we can do it more effectively and more efficiently. And then the other part of that is we want to start using some of the emerging technologies to do it, such as artificial intelligence, machine learning, blockchain, so we can do our job more effectively and efficiently, but also help our clients get access to that technology to be able to do they what to do what they do more effectively and more efficiently. That, sound, that sounds like the way forward, definitely with the technology piece as well. So I guess for many self-employed people like myself, we don't always prioritize investing our 9.5% or any percent every year into super because often there are more pressing costs. If you are growing a business, you've got new projects you want to reinvest mm-hmm. in. Obviously, there's a concern that our accumulated super, super will run very low in retirement if we can't sort of either exit the business making a big sale or somehow some, some kind of success which mitigates that. Um, superannuation downfall, if you like. So what is your main advice for small businesses and sole traders who might be listening? Look, I think that's a really important issue because not just sole traders and, and small businesses, we're actually seeing the rise of more of what we might call the sharing economy or gig economy. And those people also won't get access to the same sort of superannuation coverage. So there is a major issue in Australia that even though we have compulsory super, it's only compulsory if you're employed. And so for more and more people doing things like you're doing, um, taking that very brave move and going out on your own, or moving to more of a sharing economy or even a portfolio approach to your employment, which we're seeing more and more, those sort of people aren't being covered by superannuation. So I see there's a couple of things that need to happen here. One is that the government needs to look at how they can broaden the coverage of superannuation away from just not just those that are in fully employment. The other part of it is having access to guidance and and education for people who, like yourself, aren't part of a superannuation fund, aren't part of the superannuation environment. So where would you go um, to get that sort of help that you might need to give you some ideas or to help guide you? And you don't want to go and pay tens of thousands of dollars for financial planning. So what we are seeing is some people setting up some interesting digital products. Sometimes they get called robo-advisors but digital wealth management platforms where people can get access to that sort of information. And how does that work? I mean, do you have any examples of those that we could sort of bring to life? Yeah, so there's some examples in Australia such as Stockspot and Clover, and there's many more in production. We're seeing in the United States Betterment and Wealthfront are two examples, which are trying to democratise the access to financial services. So if you're not part of the a superannuation fund, which has tools and guidance and that sort of thing, where can you go to access that information? And we've got uh, many of the banks are developing those sort of digital wealth management platforms that are trying to democratise the access to that sort of advice and make it cheaper for you to access. But I think the bottom line is, as an individual, you need to think about what sort of outcomes you're looking for in retirement and then how you're going to fund it. I think that's a, I think that's a really good point. I mean, we did. Sit, my husband and I have sat down with 
you know, a strategic planner for our whole wealth management about six months ago, very adult things to do, <laughs> and kind of went, well, what's your, what's your number? When would you like to retire all going well? You know, health issues and things happen, but, you know, how do we get there? So I think that's that's a conversation which I hadn't actually had before, even though I've been working for, you know, over 20 years. So uh, it was really a game changer in many ways for me. And, and part of it's a challenge because – the world's changing dramatically, both the nature of work and the future of what work might look like, and also from a health point of view. We don't know how long we're going to live for, and we don't know what the cost of that living in retirement will be. So it's very hard now for someone in, say, their 20s or 30s to say, categorically, oh, I'll need X amount when I retire. And now we talked about that a bit earlier of would 12% be enough? And the short answer is it depends. And I know that's a bit of a cop-out answer, but it actually there's so many variables now when you come to retirement. Actually, the, the working life and the savings you need to do in your working life, uh, they're complex but fairly straightforward compared to post-retirement where there's all of a sudden could be a health issue. People might have different changes in their circumstances. And we also are seeing a lot of people are retiring, but they've got adult children living at home. Absolutely. Which, you know, they haven't actually moved out or they've moved out and come back, the boomerang children. No. And they might also have elderly parents who, you know, they ne don't necessarily live with, but they have to help fund them into a care facility or, you know, some other arrangement. That's right. So, so again, superannuation is not the only means to prepare for retirement. And, you know, if you're building up a business and – or being well a successful business, you know, that can be part of your um, retirement plans. So there's yeah, different absolutely. ways of doing it, and and superannuation is only a part of it. And one of the challenges with superannuation, and why we're seeing more and more people becoming a little bit sceptical about putting money into superannuation, is the fact that the rules are changing quite regularly. And every budget, everyone sits around and says, well, what will they do with superannuation in this budget? Now, it was fairly light on in the current one, but the previous years it's been quite heavy. And, and superannuation is seen by the government as a lot of money, and they're seeing it as money that they can use for other purposes. Well, that's right. I mean, if we are talking about, you know, recent changes in Australia and the budget has recently come down, um, you know, the idea of young people accessing some of their superannuation for buying a house. I mean, I definitely have some concerns about that long term. Do you have any thoughts on whether that's going to work? It's, it's something that comes up every few years and it's an attempt to try and respond to the housing crisis we have. And I think trying to use superannuation to solve a housing crisis is always going to be set up for failure. And why do you say that? I mean, are you thinking because it just it might inflate the market? I mean, that's one concern I've heard. You know, people are just going to be paying more anyway because more people can then, you know, bid at those auctions where you've got 100 people. What's, what's the and main it, reason you think that this is not going to work? We, we need to think about superannuation and a retirement savings policy broader as dealing with the ageing population. Um, there is a housing issue and there's lots of things that need to happen from a housing perspective, but you know, giving a few thousand dollars to a, to a young person to get into the housing market might have a short-term fix, but it's likely not to have a longer-term uh, benefits to the overall longevity issues that we're facing about funding retirement. And I think also comes into that, you know, if there, if this is a housing bubble, which they're saying in the major capital cities it is, what happens if those prices go down and that was part of your retirement plan? You know, you might not necessarily be able to retire wealthy, even though people think of their house in some ways as the major asset they have. We are seeing that. And it'll be interesting to see how that plays out because currently a significant proportion of retirees do own their own residency. But that's going to change dramatically into the future. And many of the uh, measures of retirement adequacy and how much you need in retirement are based on the fact that you own your own house. Exactly. And who knows if we all will, you know, depending on when we got into the market and how big our mortgage was and all those sorts Absolutely. of things. Absolutely. And we are going to see a generation where home ownership will decrease for all sorts of reasons. And Absolutely. And so that will have an impact on the whole um, retirement adequacy problems. So to change tack a little bit as we head towards the end of the interview, you know, you must have had a few mentors or inspirational figures that you've drawn your, I guess, your philosophy of how you work and how you do life. Uh, you don't have to name them, but, you know, are there any mentors in your in, that come to mind and what have they really taught you? Um, look, I think one of the, if, like for many people, I suppose, my father has been a key inspirational figure in terms of just how he deals with 
um, people. Um, he was a pharmacist, so I'd watch him every day in the shop. And how he dealt with the different types of people that came in, he treated them all equally, listened to them, um, treated them all with respect, no matter what their education or background was or uh, ability to explain what they need, and made everyone feel comfortable. In a situation where you might be asking for embarrassing things or you might be sick or unwell. So that certainly, that, um, able to deal with everybody on face, on face value and, and, you know, not, not prejudging people. Um, we never know what they're going through in their lives. Um, and too often we can judge people based on our only short interaction with them as opposed to understanding that actually there's a whole lot going on with them as there is with us. Exactly. I think that's really good advice. And I think good leaders in business and in life understand that, that it's, you know, you think about, uh, you know, someone who has a massive amount of impact in this world and you think of figures like a Gandhi or Mother Teresa, it was that ability to treat everyone equally and with dignity and, you know, I guess a bit of compassion as well. Yeah, I think that's right. I think that's right. So to wrap up, if we can close off by sort of, you know, for anyone listening today who's like, okay, I need to do something about my superannuation. This sounds really like an area which, you know, if I ignore it, it'll be at my own peril. What would be sort of top three tips for people to get their head around the politics of superannuation? What what can they do to make sure that they're doing everything they can to retire with superannuation that they need? Yeah, look, it's a, it's a, it's always a challenging one to answer because you know I guess the important disclaimer is this is personal advice and you need to get your own personal advice. Absolutely, yep, no, definitely, exactly. It's like going to the, it's like medical advice. We can't give generic, but we can definitely kind of I guess top line talk about. Absolutely, and being in the industry for a long time and different organisations I've worked for, that gets drilled into us time and time again. Um, but it's a question that comes up all the time. I think that if, you know, from my perspective around super or around anything in life, it's be involved. Don't just dismiss it. Um, yes, it can be a bit confusing and we, yes, we see the legislation changing quite regularly. And I think, um, you know, the, the, the title for this podcast, the politics of super is uh, quite appropriate because superannuation is an incredibly political uh, industry. Um, split between the parties in the same way that, you know, it's quite, um, quite partisan the way people approach superannuation. And I think it's very easy for an individual not really understanding it to look at the fighting between the different sides of politics around superannuation and the continual changes in the rules to sort of throw up their hands and say, it's all too difficult. I'm not going to bother at all. So no heads in the sand, I'm, I'm hearing. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Or, you know, oh, everyone says I need $2 million to retire. I'll never have that much, so I'm not going to bother at all. So I think, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So exactly. I think it's about getting involved, taking an interest, um, understand what you've got, where's your superannuation at the moment, do you even know where your superannuation is, um, do you have three or four funds spread across you know, a number of providers. Um, so consolidate, get it all together in one place, and have a think about what you're trying to do in retirement or over the next 20 years or whatever, and then trying to get control of your, of your, of your circumstances. No, I think that's fantastic advice. It's been great to chat to you, Stephen. Um, we'll have some details of how to contact Stephen Hubbard on our show notes, but you've been listening to The Politics of Everything, and I'm your host, Amber Danes. Until next time. Thanks for listening today. If you've enjoyed The Politics of Everything, we thrive on feedback. So please add a short review and share the podcast with your network and your friends and family. I'm also always on the hunt for fabulous new guests. So if you've got a view to share and an idea how to get our listeners excited, please email me at amber at bespoke comms, that's B-E-S-P-O-K-E-C-O-M-M-S dot com dot A-U and we'll be sure to get back to you. Until next time.